Hi, everybody. Welcome to Life Builder Seminar Brea Chapter today. We are going online for our first seminar. And I just want you to know that we are so thrilled to have you with us today. Sitting right here to my side is LaWanda Martinez, and she is our co chapter lead and so she and I will be hosting you this morning but you know before we get into it I just want to share a little bit about Life Builders with you in case you don't know who we are. Uh, we are an organization of women of generational impact and uh, just uh, women of all shapes and sizes and gender, genders, no, we're all the same gender, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, generations is what I meant to say. And, and so we get together for monthly seminars and usually we meet uh, at the Brea Civic Center, but you know, because we've been in quarantine, uh, we've not been able to do that. So we're bringing it to you live today. Uh, and what I wanted to just share with you is that our mission and our mandate is to equip and empower women for life. That's what we do. And so we have two speakers at each seminar with the same topic. That way they can give you a, a, a different position uh, from their own perspective and viewpoint. So it really enlarges the teaching. And so our whole thing with Life Builders is to give you keys. So I wanna just show you these keys. And uh, you know, with keys, keys are just very interesting when you think about them because keys open up doors of access that have been closed in previous seasons. And they also lock doors that shouldn't be open. So we're going to encourage you today to take some notes, to listen to what's being said so that then you can apply that to your own life because they become keys. You know, uh, an interesting thing that the Lord showed me one day, uh, I used to carry around this huge key ring like this and it had probably about 40 keys on it uh, because to the building, uh, where my office is, I, I needed keys to every door, I thought. Uh, and so I would carry those around. And the Lord finally showed me one day that if we take all those keys and we don't utilize them, instead of it bringing liberty to us to have access, it actually just adds weight to us. And so I said, aha, that makes sense, Lord, thank you. So I got myself a small key ring with a door key to the front door and then I could pick up the keys later when I needed them. So what we want you to remember is that when you get a key, let it be life to you. Let it be a, a key that is in operation or activating by utilizing it. So today, those keys are coming for you. So Lawanda, what would you like to share with us? Okay, well today I wanna to share with you a little bit about what to expect from the broadcast. So to, um, first off, I would like to introduce our engineer who is Amber. Amber, can you come on and say hi? Hi everyone. This, Hi, this everyone. camera, she's going to be our technical support, our engineer. So if we have any difficulties, she can come on in right up. Thank you, Am. We appreciate you. All right. And so uh, let me just share with you a little bit more about what our agenda is going to be today. We have two speakers, as Dr. Kathy said. We're talking on the topic of choosing love when it's tough. And how many of you have been through some tough seasons, right? Mm -hmm. Things have been really tough and we need to uh, embrace how to love when things are tough. Most, most often we hear about having tough love. Oh, you just got to be tough or you got to have tough love. But what is love and how do we choose love? when it's tough. Uh, we have two speakers today. Our first speaker is going, uh, our second speaker is going to be Lori Bryant. And so I wanna go ahead and just bring her on. Hi, how's it going? This is Lori Bryant and she is a author, a speaker. She is a poet. She has a, a, a story uh, writing class. It's called uh, Lori Bryant Stories. I had the opportunity to be able to go into her, her class and become a published author. So thank you so much, Lori. Um, Lori also has an, or, an, a, a, um, an event that is called Positively Transforming where she equips women to transform their lives. And one time when Lori was speaking, she shared a story with us. She said that um, they wanted her to come and speak on a topic of, of tough love. And she asked them, would it be okay if I speak on how to love when things are tough? And oh my God, that title alone, Lori, it changed my life because as a single mom, 
I was going through very hard things with my sons. And I thought, you know, everybody's always giving me parenting advice, telling me you got to have tough love. You got to have tough love. But when you introduce the concept to me, the idea of how to love when things are tough. And, you know, I just shared a little uh, bit about this uh, earlier in my Instagram. And a couple people reached out to me and they said, I'm going to watch this broadcast because I'm dealing with some really tough stuff with my kids right now. And I said, yes, I encourage you, listen to this broadcast. So, Lori, we are looking so forward to you. Um, do you want to just share anything briefly with our audience really quickly? Yeah, I just want to say thanks for jumping on and being here and um, be willing to really even look at this topic. And, you know, you got to be open to love when it's tough. That's the first thing. And I think so we pursue love and we ask the Holy Spirit to help us. And then we got to be willing because guess what? He's going to give us some tough people to love. <laughs> so it's really kind of the learning ground. And I'm really excited to be here today. So thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, and then we also have our very first speaker. And um, Dr. Kathy, would you please introduce our speaker? I would love to. Uh, this is Cindria Abernathy, and she's one of my favorites. I've had the uh, I, you are you are Cindria, but I've had the pleasure of working with uh, Cindria for about six years now, and so I've I've really grown to appreciate her more and more. So Cindria is uh, a social media support engineer. Now that's impressive. That's all I can say. <laughs> wow. Um, she works at Condé Nast. I know I had introduced her earlier working for Google, so I think I prophesied into her a greater spectrum of work. But anyway, she does work for Condé Nast, uh, and it's a, a, a data uh, providing data technical solutions for ads and content campaigns. How about that? But I, I really just want to say about Cindria, you know, she's uh, a millennial. She's bright. She's beautiful. She's full. I'm saying full of energy. This girl is just amazing. Uh, but she has such a quality about her that is able to communicate truths. Uh, she's one of uh, the teachers in a class uh, at our church. And I just so appreciate everything about Cindria. You know, Cindria believes that media is so important and so vital in this generation because this is really the vehicle where we're going to see Acts 1-8 come to bear, where the word of God is going to go globally. And this is the way we're going to do it. So I just want to say thank you, Cindria, for being a technical genius. And you are, from my perspective anyway, at least you are. And so I'm very thrilled that you'll be with us today to share from your heart and from your experience how to choose love when it's tough. So bravo, Cindria. So I'm just going to go ahead and um, really quick, if you have a pencil and a paper, would you just take it out and would you uh, take some notes because she's going to give us some powerful keys. Keys yes. are principles that we can apply into our life. And also at the end, if you stay tuned, we're going to have a Q&A. So you'll have the opportunity to ask a question to our speaker. So if you get those questions, post them into the feed, uh, like, share. And when you're sharing the broadcast, if you would share like an aha moment, one of the keys that were revealed to you during the broadcast, that would really be great. So we're going to turn it over to you, Cindria. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you again for having me. Um, I'm so excited to be here and have the opportunity to broadcast. I was speaking with Apostle Kathy. I said, wow, you invited me last year, gave me the topic in February, and look where we are now. Like, this is amazing. So I just want to dive into the topic, choosing love even when it's tough. And one thing I can say and be honest with you about is that this topic is one thing that I struggle with. And when I presented this topic, I really turned to God and dug in and he gave me key, rele key relevation uh, as it pertains to the times and the seasons that we're living in, uh, as it pertains to just the last three months, everything we've been seeing on the news. And uh, just a quick uh, review of what I'm going to go through. And thank you, Lawanda, for encouraging them to get out a, a pencil and a paper. I am going to go a little fast. I do. I am high in energy. I did have a cup of coffee today. I probably shouldn't, but you know what? I needed it. So. Um, I'm going to go through uh, not only are we to love even when it's tough as it pertains to others, but also in ministry and also loving ourselves. And I think 
it when we when we see the topic, it quickly points back to just like a mirror. And I know we read the Bible, and it says many has many scriptures that say uh, how to love your neighbor and your enemy. And I want to dive right into Matthew five forty four, and it says, "But I say to you, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you." So that is just the quintessential scripture as it pertains to the topic right there. Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And that's something really tough to do. And what I want to do is go through a couple of examples in the Bible where it talks about uh, choosing love even when it's tough. And so we're going to go to 1 Samuel 1, 6 through 16. And this is the story of Hannah and Penina. Hannah and Penina were married to Elkanah. So they were sister wives, as we can uh, translate it in these, where these, these times. And Penina, is said that Penina would tease Hannah to the point where she became bitter. She became angry. She became depressed all over her being barren and her being without child. I think that's really shady. I think that's really wrong for someone to, actually as a woman, to point someone's uh, uh, sickness or even disease and unable to or inability to have a child. Like when we look into her story, we see like she humiliates, humiliates her. She, she uh, in public, even within a family, they were in the same family because they were wives to the same husband. So uh, one thing that stands out to me as it pertains to Hannah is her character. When you look at her character, it says that she was, uh, she was bruised. She was, she was bitter and uh, she felt really down about herself, uh, about her barrenness, watching a woman who had, 10 sons or however many children that she had. And she felt she felt really uh, inferior to her. But it says that when she went through a low season and she began to not eat or drink, her husband approached her and said, why aren't you eating and drinking? Uh, why are you so depressed? And she said, well, nothing. She didn't say anything. She got up, she, she arose within herself and she went to the temple and she laid herself before God. And this is the vow that she made to God. It says in 1 Samuel 1 and 11, it says, then she made a vow and she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a man child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come upon his head. So when we see this, uh, and she was actually blessed with the with Samuel, uh, as it says in the, in the word, uh, when you see this, um, I wanna really point to the fact that in this situation with Hannah and Penina, you can see someone overcoming the spirit of offense to the point of deep, deep depression. And I can relate to this because I was in this situation before, and when she overcame this spirit of offense, she got blessed. I think we, when she laid herself before God and she made that vow, God really looked upon her heart and she poured out her soul and she was uh, healed uh, from that, healed from her bitterness, healed from her her inferiority, healed from her, her jealousy and envy, whatever is unspoken in the scriptures. And so we want to take a key characteristic out of Hannah and look at how she overcame the spirit of offense. Now, the second, the second scripture that I want to review is uh, Ananias and Saul. So we all know the stories in Acts nine, and Saul was a Christian killer. He was a terrorist of the children of God. And so it says when he was on his road to Damascus, um, on the look for other Christians to kill, it says that he had an encounter with God and he got struck with blindness. He got struck with blindness and God said, why are you persecuting me? And he became blind. So he got, he actually went and got led blind to Damascus. And at that same time, God was dealing with Ananias. And Ananias was uh, sitting and he, he uh, the Lord said, hey, um, I need you to go minister to Saul. And and I said, wait, what? He's been killing my brother and my sister. And I'm not sure if I go, if I'm going to get killed myself. And so in that, Ananias became obedient and he arose and he went to go minister to Saul. And in that ministry to Saul, he uh, he got he laid hands on him and 
he regained sight and he got filled with the Holy Ghost. So a key characteristic that I want to, or we should take away from Ananias is that he was obedient and he went and he showed love even when it was tough. And he exhibited the unconditional love of God. And one thing that I, I saw in the scripture when I was reading this is that uh, Saul was a Christian killer. Yes, he had an encounter with God, but it took for a Christian to show the unconditional love of God and meet him where he was. And I want us to, to take that in consideration that choosing love when it's tough is not always about us. Actually, it's never about us. It's about being obedient. So to dive deeper into uh, this topic, uh, I want to go into why it was so hard for Ananias to go meet Saul. And one of the key things that I realized within my walk is that it's tough to love others because it's something called lifestyle friction. Lifestyle friction is when you don't agree with how someone lives, their value system, what they wear, where they live, where they're from, their culture, their background, who they worship, who they who they like, who they look up to, their leaders, whatever. Whatever they look up to, you don't agree with it. But one thing that I can say is that as a millennial, I run into lifestyle friction all of the time. All the time I run into lifestyle friction on the job, when I'm interacting with my friends, friends, so on and so forth. I run into lifestyle friction. And when it comes to dealing with someone who is opposite from me and I have an abrasive communication with them, I have to say, you know what? I either go left or go right. Am I going to live my life boldly or if I'm, or am I going to bow or compromise? And I always choose to live my life boldly and say, this is who I am. This is where I stand. And that's what all, you know, we all know that Apostle Kathy has that saying, never been bow or compromise. And so that's why I choose to stand. And another thing is um, I'm, I'm a millennial. I'm in social media and I choose to be an uncloseted Christian. I stand on that, an uncloseted Christian. And one thing that God has been dealing with me um, as it pertains to the topic that it's cool to be an uncloseted Christian to rep Christ, to wear all the Christian swag, but it's even greater to live as an uncompromising example of God's love. And that's where this topic is going to take this. It's going to show us the uncompromising example of God's love that we should exhibit. And it says in 2 Corinthians 2 and 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us to triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. So looking at that, it's it's true. Christian Christ, a true Christ representative is always aware of the glory that they carry. The glory that they can. We have to be aware of that. And when uh, put into situations with lifestyle friction is important to not compromise, but to be present, loving, and available. When what I mean by this is, be willing to share, be will, be confident in who you are and how you live. Don't uh, if someone says something and it's against your values, say you know what this is who I am and this is who I I I, I am. And if you don't want to accept that and you don't want to move forward in a, a friendship or a cordial relationship with me, then, you know, I've offered it to you. And one thing that I say is if they're confident in who they are and how they're living, why shouldn't you be? If they're confident in how they're living, then why shouldn't you be? I see so many times people that are closeted as Christians. And one thing, and I actually talked to Apostle Kathy about this, is one thing when Kanye West came out with, uh, you know, a Sunday services. And when I was in the workplace, me working in social media, we actually had a, a project based off of his ads. And everyone was just like, oh my gosh, Sunday service. Oh my goodness. And one thing I can say is that I really was blessed by it because when I was in the office, the only person that was living my life as a Christian and everyone knew in conversation and me just living, you know, just letting my light shine, you know? Um, when Kanye West came out, oh, everyone was a Christian. Popping up. All the lights start to come on. And I was just like, what is up with that? Like, why can't you just live your life regardless if this is popular or not? And um, I really was blessed by it. Secondly, because I really 
start to see a prodigal revival break out within my workplace. So I actually share up with that, that with Apostle Kathy, and it's just really amazing to see. Uh, going into, I want to actually dive into the ministry part. Uh, one thing that God was really uh, dealing with me on um, in this season is how I interact with unchurched people and that unchurched people are not all the same and they shouldn't be handled the same way either. So people go through different seasons just as we do different, uh, they're in different places in their lives. And when talking to non-believers, I always try to understand and identify with where they are, who they are as a person, regardless of background, culture, or even identity. And I, he showed me the scripture and we look at this as a, uh, a healing scripture. It's in Isaiah 35, 30, 53 and five. And it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And I said, wow, that's interesting. This is a scripture I use all the time in prayer. And so he said, but look at it this way. And I said, okay, I looked at it deeper from a deeper perspective. And he says, the difference between a bruise and a wound is a bruise is uh, something that when you're hit and it causes internal bleeding, but a wound is a cut that penetrates the skin causing bleeding. And when I looked at that, I said, wow, God really died for more than just one sin. He died for all of my sins. And when I look over my life, when I look at me even, you know, being bad and, you know, my preteens, my teenage years, and even me in college being backslidden like I was, I say, wow, I'm grateful. And he says, look at it, look at it this way. When you come in contact with someone, of course, you have non-believers who don't believe, the atheists, the agnostics, you know, you see them and you say, okay, well, I'm going to just live as an example. And they, you know, they react to that example. But then you also know like sinners, sinners who have a lack of discipline, they're in the sin sick phase. They may just, you know, fall here and there, but they still have a relationship with God. They just need to be disciplined. And we all have times when we need to be disciplined in certain areas of our life, just like I'm being disciplined with love. And it's so amazing at this time. And uh, we also see that we have people that are trespassers, people that just cross the line just a little bit. And they're in the transgressional season. They may be untamed and unchecked in their behaviors. And these people need to be redirected. And then we have people that are fugitives. They're just on the run. They might be backslidden for 20, 30, 15, whatever, how many years. And they're in that iniquity phase, living a lifestyle of disobedience to God. And they need to be rehabilitated, rehabilitated and restored. So the reason why I'm bringing this all up is because um, I feel like even as it pertains to me in ministry, I misjudge assignments and I mishandle ministry moments. And then I get upset at the person or frustrated at the person because their salvation didn't go the way that I planned or the way I saw it or their de deliverance backfired or the discipleship. They don't want to sit down and read through the scriptures with me. They don't want to read the book that I sent them. And you know what? I think that as people of God, that we should first look at 1 Corinthians 3 and 16 and it's 3 and 6. And it says, one plant, one waters, and God gives the increase. So in ministry, we need to figure out what are we? Are we going to sow the seed? Are we the gardener and sowing the seed? Are we going to water? Are we the department of water and power? Are we going to release on that person? And, you know, at the end, we just need to stop right there and say, you know what? I've come this far and I have to allow God to get the glory and God to give them the increase. So I say to myself when I was reading this and I was given this revelation, you know what? I need to, you know, come out of uh, the spirit of resentment and frustration when it comes to mishandling these people or when I go to, when I meet someone and give the job to God, just give the job to God and say, you know what, God, you give them the increase. So I want to take a deeper self-evaluation and I want to uh, have us look, have a, a deeper look at ourselves and take a, a deep mental and spiritual evaluation of why it's hard to love certain people and even ourselves. We have to identify why we're feeling the way that we're feeling and then deal with those feelings. It says in 1 
Peter 5 and 8, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Seeking someone to devour. Someone say, not me, not me today. So the difference, the different forms of hatred uh, I want to go through, which stem from an other deeper rooted issues that we're going to review down the line uh, are these. Jealousy, envy, distrust, prejudice, and racism. Jealousy, envy, distrust, prejudice, and racism. The enemy is forever trying to cause division between people. That is what he's after. One of his go-to taxes, of course, trying to cause dissonance between saints. Another is within the church, Christians, either peer-to-peer -peer or leader-to-member. Another way is between Christians and non-believers, people who consider themselves Christian and those who don't have a relationship with God. And these are reasons, these reasons are to create division within the body and to turn believers away from actually entering into relationship with Jesus Christ. So we look in the word and we see in Ephesians 6 and 12, and it says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now we're gonna go even deeper and, and we're gonna look at ties, traps, snares, and entanglements. Taking an even deeper look, we're gonna look at these three things. We're gonna look at, as regards to love, is uh, affiliate ties or soul ties. We're gonna look at snares of generational systemic views or, and emotional entanglements. So affiliate tie or soul tie is based on uh, being a part of a association or being a part of a group or having a soul tie with an individual. So the examples, I can only go through the examples that I've went through in my life because I evaluate this um, on myself and that's Baptist versus Kojic, two denominations that believe in Jesus Christ but have different doctrines. You speak in tongues, I don't speak in tongues. Oh, well, we're not equally yoked, I can't love you. And then in university, we can even see it within the university system. I went to Southern University and everyone within the HBCU sector can see knows that Southern University versus Grambling University. I'm affiliated with this school. I don't mess with you because you go to that school. And it's a, it's a movie about it. <laughs> and what I'm going to take you back, this is what I'm going to take you back on, is East Coast versus West Coast drama in the 90s. East Coast versus West Coast in the 90s. If you, can, if you remember, if you're not familiar, look it up. It's uh, a whole thing with rap music. Um, it was dumb as we look back on it. Um, and it should have never happened. And But that's all pertaining on the power of agreement of something that you shouldn't be in agreement with. And we cut if we cut every tie that enables us to love, we will be able to love in the full capacity in Jesus' name. Like we don't need to be left like holding ourselves back under a name of a university, under a name of a, a denomination, under a name of a, what you're being from this country or this side of the United States. If we could just sever those ties and move forward in the love of God, we will see a change. And I want to look into snares, traps, and generational systemic views. This is based on an old generation, a way of doing things versus a new generation in a way of doing things or culture. And we can look at this from generational systemic uh, racism in the United States. As we can see for 400 years ago, how we can follow the thread and the fabric of oppression from slavery on blacks in the United States. We can also see systemic, generational systemic issues as it pertains to women. And we can follow that within the thread of the United States. And also looking at different countries, we see that in the Middle Eastern country, they have an issue when it comes to women. And we can see in another developmental country, they have an issue when it comes to children and child labor. And this is all based on a generational curse that went into systems and made systems uh, what they are today. And if we can break free and, and walk in the love of Jesus, I think I really believe that not only can we be free as a people, we can be free as human beings. 
And going on from there, I want to look at generational and no, emotional entanglements. Emotional entanglements. So based on, this is based on a personal, emotional, uh, and per personal preferences. And that can be based off of temperament. Some people may not like me because I'm loud and I got a lot of energy. I'm a single and choleric. I can't help it, you know, but people like me may not be able to accept someone who's melancholy or who is a little bit more reserved. Like, what's wrong with them? They look like they have an attitude. Or another example is someone uh, in economic class. Oh, you can see someone that was raised poor. Once they get a little bit of money, they look at someone that's broke and say, oh, I just can't do it. I just don't. I just don't understand. And that's if we can just unwrap ourselves in our out of our own emotions, come unglued and release those emotions and really walk into the love of God. We can see a bigger change as it pertains to choosing love when it's tough. And so we looked at jealousy envy, distrust, prejudice, racism, and then I just listed some of the, uh, the affiliate ties, soul ties, uh, snares, and entanglements that come along with them. So we're going to dive deeper going this way. So you can look at it as, you know, that's the, the branches. Now we're going into the trunk, and then we're going to hit them at the roots. So, but where did this all come from? Remember I said that there's a, there's a deeper rooted issue here, and that deeper rooted issue is unforgiveness, offense, and hate. If I say this, if it's deep-rooted, you must uproot it. I'm a firm believer in deliverance. You know, I'm on the deliverance team. I love deliverance. I love it. And I've seen in my own life how it set me free. It's broken off so many ties, so many generational curses, and opened, them, opened my eyes to see things as God truly sees them. So the ties, as I'm going to review the ties, and the ties, the traps, and the entanglements are the branches. And then jealousy, envy, distrust, and prejudice are, uh, are, and racism are the trunks. And then now we're going to look at offense, unforgiveness, and hate, which are the roots. The enemy seeks to devour and divide us by getting us distracted and away from the bigger picture. He distracts us or derails us with different ties, traps snares and entanglements. However, at the end of the day, division comes out of the spirit of offense, unforgiveness, and hate. We have to pray that God releases us and removes these things off of our lives. These are spirits and they have to be dealt with. Once we can cast these things off of us, we can move freely into the love of God as God intended. And we want to look at Mark 12, 30 through 31, and it says, and you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul and all of your mind, and with all of your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than me. So we see loving your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your strength. Loving your neighbor and then loving yourself. Don't forget about yourself. And so we're all human. We run into confrontation all the time. However, it is our responsibility and how we choose to react when it comes to being offended or we come into difficult interactions with people. Uh, we may sometimes wrongly label people enemy. No, just because you got into a confrontation with someone or they were, they were abrasive with their lifestyle and conversation towards you and they bucked against you, that doesn't make them your enemy. The enemy is defined as a person who is actually opposing you or, or hostile to someone or something. As Christians, our, our goal is to unite against a common adversary and to be ministers of reconciliation. Our goal is to love the unloved, the unlovable, and although it may be hard, we should always take a, a sit back and when we're dealing with these people and say, you know what, I'm going to be like Ananias. And I'm going to say, you know what, God loved me even when it was tough. So I'm done. Be blessed. Thank you, Apostle Kathy. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. Thank you so much, Cindria. That was incredible. We super great, great, appreciate great. you. Great keys. I love how you shared about um, just getting untangled from all of that emotional entangledness. 
It was really incredible. Yeah, it was incredible. You know, Sindri, one thing I want to say is that uh, you you really are a, a voice in a generation, and uh, you and people like you are going to make a great difference. So thank you for being you and never compromising. Don't bend about or compromise. <laughs> Amen. All right. Okay. Thank you so much for having uh, for joining us. Um, if you are just joining in on the broadcast right now, this is Life Builder Seminars, and we are having our topic on choosing love when it's tough. We just appreciate you all coming on, joining, sharing. If you got some really incredible, powerful keys from Cindria, you can um, post like an aha moment or a key and share the broadcast with your friends because I believe that they will really be blessed. Yes. This is just a small example of what to expect when you come to one of our Life Builder seminars. We meet on the fourth Saturday in Brea at the Civic Center every fourth Saturday. And we have several chapters throughout Southern California. You can look at our website, Life Builder Seminars. Dot com. That's lifebuilderseminars.com. And if you are enjoying how we are bringing this to you, we want to build this platform. And if you'd like to invest in Life Builders, once again, you can go to lifebuilderseminars.com, select the Brea chapter and give your investment there. Now we're going to transition into our next speaker. And uh, because we usually have two speakers at our seminars and each speaker shares their take on the topic because there's more than one perspective and there's more than one way that we can communicate to bring about how to choosing love when it's tough. Mm -hmm. And so um, also if you have questions mm -hmm. that you'd like to ask our speakers or Dr. Kathy, please post those into the feed so that we can answer those questions live in the broadcast mm -hmm. at the very end. All right, okay. So um, I would like to go ahead and bring on Lori. Hey there. Hey. Hi. Hey, Lori. Well, we just want to go ahead and turn this seminar right over to you because we want to get some more great keys and great strategies. So go ahead. All right. All right. So I first I want to just say, was Cindy amazing or what? Like we can really build on what she had to say. Like if you just applied what she was saying right now, like your life would immediately change. The one thing I picked up this, I wrote it down. Um, because this is definitely something I'm going to take a look at and dive into more with the Lord. And this is, um, uh, she had this phrase, lifestyle friction, right? Lifestyle friction. Like, where do we get rubbed the wrong way? Because really, if everybody agreed with us, wouldn't we get along with them, right? Right? I used to tell everybody, oh my gosh, if my kids just did everything that I said, I would be the best mom ever, right? Or if my husband would just do what I said, like this marriage would be, you know, off the charts here. So anyway, what I want to dive into right now is also um, about three keys with you, but walking through maybe a little bit of now, how do we do this, right? Because we all know it, we all hear it. And how do we actually do this? What I really love is that in Luke, uh, Luke was asked, or Luke asked Jesus, he said, you know, um, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? Right now, he was a lawyer. So how many of you know if a lawyer asks you a question, it's going to be set up a little different than somebody else, right? So Luke asked him the question, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? And it, you know that there were 10 commandments already by then, but there were actually uh, 613 laws that the Jewish people had come up with. So he's really putting him on the spot, right? And in the way that Jesus always does, right? Nothing shakes him. Nothing, nothing jars him. He just kind of looks like almost casually says, you know, oh, that's easy. And I think he looks at the crowd and he looks at Luke and he just says this, love and love. And uh, Cindy had touched on it. It was love God and love people, right? We know that it says that, that there are all these things, but three things remain, faith, hope, and love. But then it says, and the greatest of these is love. So a long time ago, I sat down and I thought, okay, Lord, I'm trying to grow. I'm trying to, to do what you want me to do. I'm trying to, you know just be the best me with you that I can be and love people. And how many of you know, you can try, you can grit your teeth. You can like head out to be like, I'm going to be the best lover of people in God that there's ever been. And then you get on the freeway. Right. Or as for me, it was like sometimes in the morning I'd be like, and then I go downstairs and see what my kids and my family are all up to. Right. And all of a sudden we can get thrown out of love right away. So anyway, what was happening is that the Lord was just saying, listen, if you can focus on these, right? And so when I when I saw these couple of scriptures together, it was like, okay, well, this is what I'm going to do for a while then, right? So I can really get back on track and start changing the rest of the world is I'm going to pursue love. And 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says this, right? It says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts. Okay, how many of you desire spiritual gifts? 
right? We want them. It's like, they're amazing. I ask for all the gifts all the time. It's like, yeah, I want miracles and signs and wonders and, you know, walking in, you know, miraculous things and being powerful with people and, you know, hearing God and pro prophetically uttering things that, you know, heaven knows and we get to hear and all these things. But what it really says is this, is it says, pursue love, right? It's like he's saying first, First, before you try those other gifts, like before you desire them, like you better be careful because if you get those things and you don't have this, you're going to be dangerous and you could be hurtful. And so pursue is an action, right? Pursue. When you think of to pursue something, it really is to captivate it. It's to catch it. It's to, you know, embrace it. It's to when I when I'm in pursuit of something, it's with the intent of of capturing captivating, embracing, and in this case, becoming, right? And so, and then it says, and then desire. And when you look at the definition of desire, right? Once we pursue love, which I think is just ongoing, really, I thought it was going to be a season ends up, it's going to be something that I'm going to have to keep continuing to do, uh, looks like till the day I die, right? So we're pursuing love. Um, desiring is a word more like, um, I want, I wish, and I hope. Right. And, and in this in this case, with spiritual gifts, we should be asking. It says ask, um, you know, the Lord for spiritual gifts and especially ask for the prophetic. Um, and in the, the case where it says that, you know, on earth, we have a good father who desires to give us good gifts. Right. It goes through this whole teaching where it says you wouldn't ask for bread and he would give you a stone. And then it goes on to say, um, ask him for good gifts. He wants to give you better gifts than your earthly father. And what he goes on to say then is ask for the Holy Spirit, which really when when we think about that, everything flows out of him. So I have problems with my kids. Ask for the Holy Spirit. Right. Love is supernatural. We Sometimes we think we can just muster it up. Right. If I muster it up, it's like everything else I try to grit my teeth and do. It's going to last for a little while. But we're talking about love is actually um, very supernatural in nature. It says that God is love. He desires that this is a fruit of the spirit in our life. This is a spiritual gift that we walk in. And sometimes we forget that just like all the other supernatural gifts that we can love our neighbor well, we can love our family well. But I uh, told my family one time, you know what? I really desire to love you supernaturally. I don't want to love you naturally anymore. I don't want to be a, a natural loving neighbor. I want to be supernatural. I want to be loving in a way that they see Jesus in me and I don't even ever have to mention his name, right? I might, but I don't have to. It's so like I said one time, I, I my real hope was that people would say, how did you get like this? And then I could tell them I'm a Christian. And then I could tell them that I, you know, go to church and read the Bible and that it's in there. So anyway, so for me, the first key uh, that I want to talk about is um, the pursuit of love. Right. And so when we set ourselves out on the pursuit of love, it's it's an action. It's an it's a you know, activity that we're doing. And the way that we pursue is in Corinthians 13, it's the love chapter, right? And it tells us like all these, these things of what love is, right? A lot of people can really knock off, spout out, make, go through the list of what love is. But let me just read you right now, because this is something that um, got my attention a, a couple of years ago. And it was in Corinthians in that first part where it's talking about all the things that love is. It has more to say about what love isn't than it does about what love is. And so these are these are the things it says. It says, love doesn't envy, right? Uh, Cindria just talked about that. It's not envious. Love does not envy. It does not boast, right? It's not prideful. It doesn't boast. Have you ever seen someone who just, like, you feel like, you know, oh my gosh, like, do you care about anybody else? And can you talk about anybody else? And have you ever been that person where it's like every time someone's talking, I have to say something about myself too. And I think that these things that when we, we look and get in pursuit of them, right? Again, we're pursuing love. We also are um, trying to pursue to get rid of what love isn't, right? And so it's bo it isn't boastful. It isn't prideful. Okay. I love this. It doesn't dishonor. Right. And so one of the things I said, even in ministry, like you're not going to fail as a minister. Um, and, and it was three things that the Lord showed me. And one was if your motive is love. 
right? The motive for ministering to people. It's not like the motive isn't like, oh, I led someone else to Jesus, so I have a notch on my on my board here and I can start adding them up, right? The motive is actually just to, to purely just love the person and let God be the one who works on them. And God's the one that, you know, ultimately will draw them to himself and that God is the one they'll surrender to, not to you. So the motive is love. God, do I love people? And like Cinderia was saying that, you know, if I have these lifestyle frictions and there are whole groups of people that I have trouble loving, then I've got to go back to that because he's not just calling me to love the people like me. He's not just calling me to love the people that like me. He's not just calling me to a certain, you know, group of people that, that I easily can relate to. And so I think that this is then where, when we're constantly laying ourselves before him saying, God, I, I really desire that my motive here would be love. The second one is that my model is honor, right? And we're looking at here at uh, 1 Corinthians 13 again, it says love does not dishonor. So when it doesn't dishonor, the, the fact is that love honors, right? It's, it's highest goal in love is to honor God and honor people. Right. And so I have to ask myself when I feel even an unction to minister to someone or to, you know, try to reach them in any way. It's like I have to say, wait a minute, like, is this really going to honor God? And is it really going to honor the person? Like, have you ever had somebody come up to you in the name of ministry or, you know, and they, they want to correct you and they want to help you. And I believe that most of the time their motive is, you know, really to do that. But afterwards, you feel violated or you feel like that didn't do what I think they wanted it to do. And I believe that the reason is because sometimes we just move forward and we don't really say, is this going to honor this person right where they're at? Like, is this my agenda or is this God's agenda? And the third one is Jesus is the demonstration. Right. That, that Jesus is the demonstration. And we we the more that we're in the Bible, the more that we're reading for ourselves. I tell people all the time. Right. Go back to um, the book of John. It's a great place to go back to again. Go back to, you know, Matthew, Mark and Luke. Go back and look at when Jesus was alive. Like I want to keep looking at what did he do? Right. And it's surprising. Like I had been a Christian for a long, long time. And then I decided one day I'm going to read the red letter Bible. Right. And that's just where everything that Jesus said is in red. And I went back and I thought I knew. Right. I've been a Christian a long time. I thought I knew. But sometimes I was just like, oh, my gosh, like, are you kidding me? Like he said this. And sometimes I was like, uh, there are some things that I think I think he said that. I'm not finding in the red letters anywhere. And it, sometimes we're taught and we're taught over years or we perceive things and they're wrong. Right. And so if we're going to do a walk in the demonstration. So again, um, I think it's on your screen. If our motive is love, our model is honor and the demonstration is Jesus. You can't fail. Right. You can't fail. What I mean by that is it gets rid of for me. It took, took some time. It gets rid of the risk of reaching out. It gets rid of like the, the fear of what if they don't receive it? Because the truth is who in, can't receive love in an honoring way? Like as if you are the hands and the mouth and the feet of Jesus. And so um, anyway, love doesn't dishonor. Again, you can, go, you know, if you feel like that, that's something that you need to look at, that you've been dishonored or you feel like I'm, I'm harsh. People have said I'm harsh or you don't understand, like, that's a good thing to go and study and look up again. It says that love isn't selfish, right? It isn't selfish. It's not thinking about itself. It's not easily angered. I love that it puts in there the word easily, right? Because it doesn't say it's not angered, right? And and we're all going to do well and sometimes not do well. It doesn't say that it's never angered. I love that it says it's not easily angered, right? And so, have you been that person or have you you been with someone who um, sometimes I that people will say this, Lori, can you help me? I have such a, a short fuse. Right. I just feel like anything that my family says, I'm about to blow anything that people at work say I'm about to blow. And like Cindria said, you can go back and see those three things. If I have hate or I have unforgiveness, or I have offenses, right? That's the, pl the, the place to start because I'm going to be easily angered 
when I have offenses and, and unforgiveness, right, which does lead to hate um, and bitterness. And it says bitterness defiles many. And so um, be honest with yourself. Um, what you can do right now, even sitting where you are, some of you are thinking like, Lori, that's me, right? You want to raise your hand or I love when it, when I'm teaching with a crowd because it's so interactive, we can talk and ask questions. But right now, if you're thinking like, Lori, that's me, I'm so easily angered. Like I don't even know myself anymore. I just, I go off on everybody and for any little thing. Um, right now, even, I know we're going to have a ministry time later, but I feel like even like if that's you just right now, just, um, just quietly right now, if you want to close your eyes, if you want to get really quiet, right? This is the first key and we want to pursue love. We want to be able to be love. Just get very, very quiet. Um, and just right now, just repeat after me. Just ask the Father, Father God, is there anyone that I need to forgive? Show me their face. Show me their name. Right. It might be more than one person. You might have a whole list, but just just ask right now, really genuinely, um, even Father God, is there anyone that I need to forgive again? Because a lot of times we'll think that we forgave. And if he brings it up, don't argue with it. Right. Don't 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 argue with God. Some of you might be surprised. Right. And just once again, it literally it says that, um, you know, forgiveness is not about the feeling. It's not that the other person agrees. It's not that they need you to forgive them or they think that they do. Um, it doesn't even really have to do a lot of times with them. They could even be deceased or gone. Right. And they could not care that you are in this place and that they hurt you. Um, but once again, we're just saying, you know, Lord, by an act of my will. I forgive. And then whoever it is, just remind yourself say their name for, and then list out what they did, right? Some of us have things that people have done that feel like they're unforgivable. The problem is that I heard it said one time that unforgiveness is like drinking the poison and waiting for the other person to die, right? And a lot of times they're gone. They're not hurting, but you are. A lady one day told me, Lori, I can't, like this person was so hideous to me. I can't, you know? And what I said was, she was talking about like, I feel like they're going to get away with this. And it's like, listen, they're not off the hook. They're off of your hook. And some of you today in the pursuit of love, you're just saying like, you know, I have this anger. I have this bitterness. It's, it's hard for me. I have hate. Right. And right now I feel like the Lord's saying, just let me take those people off of your hook. Right. The funny thing is you can always pick them back up again later. I can always unforgive them and, you know, go back to the way I was feeling. And we all know that we kind of ebb and flow with this. One of the things is just to forgive and to keep on forgiving and to keep on forgiving and to keep on forgiving until it's so easy. It's like your second nature because you know how true it is. One of the other things is when I realize how much I've been forgiven of, I just start making a list about what, I, what I've been forgiven of, right? And I get to about the, you know, end of the first page. I'm not even on the 27th page of all the things I've been forgiven of yet. And all of a sudden, humility comes back on me and the ability to forgive comes again, right? And so um, one time I was in an auto accident. I was hit by a drunk driver. It ended up that all this crazy, you know, damage and hurt and stuff happened to me. But somebody on the scene said, Lori, you got to that drunk driver. And he got out of his truck. He didn't even know where he was. And they said, you hugged him and asked him how he was. And I, all I can say is it wasn't like something I was thinking of. It wasn't later. It was something that years and years of forgiving some of the most hideous things that could happen to you, forgiving those things and realizing how free it is that I think we can become love. I think, I think that we never get there completely, but I feel like that we can surrender to it in a way that we get better where, you know, you've heard somebody say that when, you know, a tea bag gets hot and under pressure, what's in it comes out. We want what's inside of there that comes out of us to be forgiveness, to be unoffendability, right? To be loving. And so um, I think this is one of the way actively that we can head ourselves in that direction, if you will. Right. The other thing is, I love this because this happened to me a couple of times with in dealing with people. And it says love keeps no record of wrong. OK, how many of you have a record of wrong against somebody? OK, and the way you're going to know is that when you when they do something wrong, it's more wrong than anybody else. Right. <laughs> like they they uh, one time uh, 
my husband, I was just so angry about everything. And the poor guy, he like has a glass, right? And he swirls the ice. And I'm like, why are you swirling your ice? Like, that's like nails on a chalkboard to me. And he was like, oh my gosh, like I've always swirled my ice. It makes your drink colder. And I'm like, it doesn't make your drink colder. And I had to take a look at all the offenses that have piled up on me, right? I was a manager of a dental office and I had a lady come in one day and she said, you know, I need to talk to you because I don't think you're doing your job right. And, you know, I want to talk to you now. So we go in and she said, um, gives me this like little steno notebook thing. And I look at it and so one of my employees, right? One of the other employees. And she's like, here's a list. And it had days and times and what this woman had done wrong. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this takes a lot of, you know, energy to do this, right? And I said, okay. And I'm looking at, she's like, I think you need to do something about all of this. And every day there's something. And I said, okay, can you give me the book on me? Like what I do wrong, right? And all of a sudden she went, I, I don't have a book on you. And I went, well, why not? Like I do things wrong all the time. Like I'm ridiculously wrong all the time. And so then I said, well, how about the receptionist or the doctor? And she's like, no. I know. Right. And she started to tear up because you realize it takes a lot of effort to have a book of wrong on people. And so it says love isn't easily angered. It doesn't keep record of wrong. Right. And so when we're in pursuit of love, and that's the first key is I think that it's just this growing, changing pursuit. It's active. I want to capture that. Right. If three things remain, faith, hope, and love, why am I majoring on things that don't remain? Right. I want to be known at the end of my life. Like really seriously, I tell my family, like, help me love you so well that in the end of my life, all you can think to say is Lori loved well, right? She loved God and she loved people. I mean, Jesus said it when he was asked, so why not us, right? The second key is activate your love, right? And I feel like this, like we talked about pursuit being in action, but to activate your love. And it's funny because when you teach, you have notes, right? And, and, uh, Cindria said like all, all kinds of things that I had in my notes, which really just shows up like this is the Holy spirit. And so what I had about activation were the things that she had, um, also that in order to activate it, we have to be unoffendable or, you know, pursue being unoffended, um, to forgive, and then to really know when we have hate. One of the big things in all of that that we can do that's an, that's an activation. And right now it's so important, right? You guys know that my ministry um, has been called Lori Bryant's Stories. And I have been teaching writing classes about how to write your story. I've written stories. I've, you know, posted stories. I have a page on Facebook that's just called Lori Bryant Stories because I think that that all the time it's the story, right? Jesus said um, in Matthew, he said he never taught publicly without a parable, right? Because you can think of 10,000 messages at church you've ever heard right? And they're not that clear. Like, I can't tell you. I've been going to St. Church for 27 years. I love my pastor's teaching. But what I can tell you right away is some of the stories that he told, right? That some of the stories that demonstrated the message. And so in that storytelling, right, it is the ability to be able to personally connect. So I teach the writer's workshop on how to tell your story. But what I do is, as um, a, a you know, an activity in that group is I have people sit in groups of three and then just listen, right? While well, someone tells a painful or a hard or a, a an area of life that they thought they were going to be overtaken. And the listener is simply just listening, right? Just engaging, but not interrupting, just listening to, in order to really hear, not to have a response, not to have a something that would fix them, right? Listening in this way is not like, even not even like, let me tell you what happened to me, or let me fix you, or let me, you know, tell you how to feel or what to do. And most of the time um, in, in all the lay counseling that I do, right, I tell people I teach this, uh, this model called love approach. And most of the time, it's that L- in the acronym that's listen and learn. And really I say right next to that 85 or 90, like anyone who can, who can develop the skill of really listening to learn, right. To be a student instead of a teacher, no matter what your age is or what you know, or how many degrees you have piled up, right. You, when you're listening and how many of you know, like in, in 
what our world is experiencing right now, part of the problem is that we aren't good listeners. We don't hear to learn. We have our own experience. We have our own background. We have the things that make us the way that they make us, but we can't just normally sit in someone else's pain and understand when it's not our experience. And so, um, you know, I got kind of quiet on social media um, after the George Floyd video came out. My heart was so broken. And most of the time that sends me where I'm such an outward person that sends me to be such an inward person. Right. And I just, I'm just a ball. I just think like, I don't know what to do. And I feel like I don't want to say the wrong thing. And then a lot of times I say nothing. Right. And that that I feel like isn't helpful at all either. And, you know, I have a daughter that was like, Mom, you got to listen to how I'm feeling, too. She's my, she's a biracial person. And I just never engaged that part of it and avoided a lot of things. But she was like teaching me and training me to, to like listen and be open and hear. And so what I did is just privately, I have lots of friends of lots of shades and lots of different colors and I started sitting with them and said, you know what? Tell me stories. Tell me. And some of them, I was like, how could I be in relationship with you for 25 years? And I don't know that story, right? A couple of them, I was like, how could I not know that? Like, I've got to be a better listener. See, to activate love, we've got to engage with people. And that that lifestyle friction, Sandrea, I'm going to use it a lot, okay, because I am in love with that because that is really the heart of where this is. There's lifestyle friction, and those are the stories that are hard to listen to, right? Most of us surround ourselves, no matter what our persuasion, what our political view, what our news station, what our whatever, we mostly are surrounded with people who think um, like us and look like us. And whatever, wherever you are, like look around your own circle. And when people don't agree with that, they kind of, sometimes we put them on the outside and we need to really keep them on the inside in order to listen and to learn, right? It's really a choice. It's choosing to live, to, to love. And one of the things that I think is also the Lord is very clear about operating in the opposite spirit, right? He says a gentle word turns away wrath. I was driving through the Starbucks um, early on before even the Starbucks got shut down, right? And I pull up, I had ordered my coffee and I pulled up and this young African-American girl that um, I see all the time and, you know, talk to her and stuff. I was like, hey, how's it going? And she's like, oh gosh, it's so bad. And people are so mean right now. And she goes, that guy right behind you, he was yelling at me, like screaming at me just a minute ago. And I'm afraid for him to even pull up right now. And I said, um, you know, Jesus talks about that all the time. Do you want me to show you how to break that off? You won't. You don't have to be afraid at all. And she was like, okay, like, yes, I do. Like, tell me right now. And I said, okay, this is what we're going to do. I said, I'm going to buy his coffee, but I want you to say this, that the woman in front of you paid for your coffee and she wants you to know that God is crazy about you. He loves you so much. And she, I go, just that simple. You don't have to like engage anything else. Just as soon as he comes up, just let him know that, that his coffee was paid for. And I said, I'll demonstrate to you that the opposite spirit will shut down what you were just experiencing. I said, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to fight. You don't have to get your manager. You don't have to do any of that. So she said, oh my gosh, like, this is crazy. I'm going to do that. I'm so like, where'd you come from? And, you know, and so I left. Well, uh, a little while later, I pulled through and here she is again. And she's like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I was waiting to see you again. I have to tell you what happened. And she said, that guy pulled up like guns out, ready to just blast me. And I said, wait, 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 sir. And I told him exactly what you said. And he just got quiet and he just took his coffee. And she goes, now, he didn't do or say anything, but I could see his whole body just, right? Because we don't know what he's going through. We don't know what just happened at home before he left. We don't need to. We don't need to engage it. In fact, my pastor, his name's Dan Carroll. He's just the awesome. He said this uh, one time teaching. He said, you don't have to attend every fight you're invited to, right? How many fights have I attended? I didn't even want to go to. Why did I show up, right? And so it really just literally was like, I don't have to fight with this person. There's no need to. And so that's a whole teaching in itself. Um, it really is supernatural inability as well. Um, but the idea that, that we can actually change the atmosphere is true, right? If someone is anxious, 
and we are just peaceful, right? Sit in the presence with them with just the peace that God is giving us and extending it to them. We break off those things, right? And so we're choosing um, to be activated and look at the opposite spirit. The third one, the third key that I want to touch on today before we go back um, with uh, Lawanda and Pastor Kathy is intentional love, right? Intention. What is your, your intention to love? See, one of the things is most of us have an intention to control. Right now, come on. I know some of you don't like the C word. And uh, I'd like to say I just have none of it anymore. And I, I always, you know, you say like, oh, I'm so unoffendable. And then bam, something comes up that really offends you again. You go, okay, I have work to do. Like I have to you just let you know, I don't know anything. I'm a, I'm a student and a learner too. When I teach, I like to say, I don't teach because I have all the answers. I teach because I like you to ask better questions. But in this area, it's like, when I'm trying to control you, right, tell you what to do, try to manipulate you, try to guilt you, try to right, get you on board with me, then that control itself, you will be repelled from me, right? Completely repelled from me. It's like anyone who's ever tried to control you, right? Do you want to be around them? Do you're like, oh, this is so wonderful. Let me just hang around them all the time so they can tell me, you know, how dumb I am and how much I should do what they do. So in this intentional love, it takes the, uh, the even when our kids were little, like I think, I thought I controlled my kids when they were toddlers, right? But I was just bigger and they just couldn't make decisions. And even that was an illusion. I didn't really control them. As they got older, I realized when I try to step in, and tell them what to do or disapprove of what they were doing or judge them or, you know, all these things that we do. Now, as moms, a lot of times it's because our heart is so attached to them. We can't stand to see them go down a road that's hard or have pain. But the truth is when I try to control, I lose my influence. And the Lord told me one day, Lori, influence is way better than control. Like now, they might, might not care about my influence for a season and all of them were different. But eventually they come back and they want to know, right? Most of the time they already know, way, way, way over know what you think and what you feel. But they come back, right? Influence is greater than control. See, love, love isn't prideful and boastful, which is really what it means when we want our way. Have you ever received grace, right? Just grace, just love, when you thought that you deserved punishment or when you had done something really wrong and you knew the hammer is coming, right? The hammer is coming. See, no one ever got saved by guilt and shame. You don't shame people into the kingdom, right? It says it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Repentance means change our mind, change our heart. We don't change our mind and our heart when someone is shaming us and guilting us and judging us and telling us what we need to do, right? Right? It's in the presence of love. And so if you've ever been in that position, right, where you knew I deserve punishment right now, I deserve like, I, I would tell my kids sometimes, at least a talking to, right? And you got love and you got grace and you got forgiven and you got another chance. Now, I'm not saying that's always the way it goes, but I'm just saying it's rare and it's powerful. And when we get something like that, it's kind of like changes us. It changed me. Right. I have a grandmother and I'm going to end with this. I think we're getting close. I, I have, I have a grandmother and, um, I was the oldest of, you know, a bunch of grandchildren, the oldest child in my family. And, um, so it was never like, it was just Lori, except when I went to my grandma Hilda's, right. And she was wonderful. And so it, when I would go over there, it would be Lori day, right. It's Lori day. And she knew like what was hard with me. She paid attention. She talked to me. She encouraged me. She would cheer me on. Like one of the things about being a grandma that I love, I wish I was a grandma attitude as a mom more than I was because being a grandma is the greatest thing. I just told my grandson yesterday, you're the smartest, most talented, wonderful person I know. And he said, I know, tell me more, right? Because he knew I have more to say about how wonderful you are. So here's my grandmother and it would be Lori Day. And on Lori Day, like you could eat what you wanted to have her cook. You could put the TV channel on whatever channel you wanted it. She would read you whatever book that you wanted to read. You could go to the park if you wanted, or, you know, she would sit down and play Barbies with you. It was, it was, it was Lori day. And so, um, you know, 
there was a time where I took my daughter to her and I saw my daughter outside playing and I was a single mom. I was divorced. I was in a hurry. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my gosh, the next generation, my daughter is having Lori Day, right? Or Melissa Day. And my grandmother was loving her the way that she had loved me. One of the things is some of you have never been loved that way. You, you say, I don't have anyone unconditionally loving me. Um, and the greatest thing is I have the opportunity to have that experience or not, but I have the ability to be that to other people. And today I would just really encourage you, look at these keys, look at these things we've talked about, dive into the love of God and purpose yourself to become that for other people, your family, the people you minister, the people in your church, even your enemies, become someone who creates an atmosphere where people feel unconditional love. That is so good. Thank you so much, Lori, for sharing. So Create Thank and you guys for having us. Yes. yes. Thank you so much. I just love those keys. Love is the motive. Honor is the model. And Jesus is the demonstration. Yes. Thank you. All right. Well, we are going to move into a new part of uh, a new segment of Life Builder Seminars online. And this is going to be our question and answer. So if you have any questions for our speakers or for Dr. Kathy, would you please come on and um, type in the broadcast some of your questions. And I actually have a question for, um, I love that, Lori, you shared about being a grandma because I, what I just thought <laughs> about is that if we could uh, a approach the people that offend us as if they were our grandchildren. You know, oh my gosh. And how could we make it be about them and love them and find those great qualities in the people that offend us? So I want to ask a question about... Um, Let's see, what are what are some ways, Lori, that we can show honor? Well, the thing is that what honor shows to other people is valuing who they are, right? Not having them have to come into agreement with what we are or what we think is right. And so the highest level of honor, I think Jesus always demonstrated, right? He said it says he looked at the woman called in adultery, right? And looked at her and had no judgment. He said, Woman, where are your accusers? And then he said, I'm not either. Right. And so I think that when we really honor people, we put a high value on them just where they are. And we're not threatened by that. Right. I'm not threatened by your behavior. I used, you know, my kids, I would say, like, if if someone else's behavior changes mine, I'm wrong. They're just being their self. Why am I reacting? I'm wrong. I need to get right with God again. I want to be love. I want to stay in love. I want a foundation so solid that you can do anything that you want. Right. It doesn't yes. change me. I love that so much. Mm -hmm. I have used that in my life. So from the moment I heard you say that, that if someone else's behavior changes mine, then I'm wrong. And I have to think about what is going on inside of this girl right here. That's <laughs> change. That's making me get anxious. That's making me get excited or offended or bothered. Right. Then something has to be me. I can't just be judging on other people. Did, um, okay. Uh, Sandria, you talked about snares and traps and generational systems systematic views and you also talked about emotional entanglements um can you speak to us about that a little bit more of like how to get out of how to get delivered or how to get some freedom when we are in those kind of systems um first uh we have to take a self-evaluation a deeper self-evaluation and also turn to deliverance um i know everyone is not a deliverance minister or has access to deliverance but they have uh a deliverance ministry at International if you want to get that uh, that ministry done. Um, but personally, I like to just sit, take a self-evaluation, look at uh, my family systems, listen to how other people are uh, combating that system, and then try to deal with it um, through the word of God. Okay. Um I want to ask Dr. Kathy, since you brought up regency and deliverance, a lot of people don't know what deliverance is. So Dr. Kathy, would you be able to give us a little bit of an explanation? Because when I hear deliverance, I'm thinking, oh my God, my demon's possessed. I have Exorcist. <laughs> Exorcism. And I think that that's the stigma behind the word deliverance. So if you can help us and our viewers understand what deliverance is and how we can get it. Sure. You know, it's very interesting because whenever you say deliverance, people go back to the, the movie, The Exorcist. <laughs> and, you know, no heads are going to spin. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, but the thing is, it's, it's casting out, breaking and casting out those things that have had a, a hold on you. It's called a stronghold. Uh, you know, I am in my counseling, 
I always teach people how to do self deliverance. Yes. Because so many times, you know, now if there's if there's a, an issue that you can't get to, then you need somebody to help you. Uh, but the beautiful part of it is because we have the word of God, we can go through on a daily basis self deliverance. So when things begin to show up, we can get rid of them. Uh, you know, it tells us uh, in the word in that we uh, are to ekbalo or we are to cast out demons. And so you don't invite them out, you cast them out. And so the first thing, I, I go through a five, five point thing and I call them the five R's. And this is so simple. If we would just remember these, I use them. Uh, God gave these to me about 40 years ago and I still use them. Every time something comes up, I walk through that process so that I don't allow that stronghold to take a, a grip on me. But the first R is you have to recognize what is the issue. And so if we recognize it, then we can deal with it. Every time we shove it back down because we're ashamed of it or we're too afraid to deal with it, it just takes a, a stronger grip on us. So the first thing is recognize. And you know, even, even um, AA uh, talks about with alcoholism or addiction of any type, uh, until you acknowledge that you have it, but you have to recognize it before you can acknowledge it, you can't do anything with it. So first R is recognize. The second R is we repent. We ask God to forgive us for our part. And so many times people say, but I didn't do anything. It was done unto me. Well, once you embrace what was done unto you, now it's become yours. So we have to repent for that. Father, forgive me for embracing the sin that was done unto me. And so we, we repent for that. But repentance isn't the same as renouncing. And so the third R is we have to renounce it. We give it no right to remain in us. Now, I know this is very elementary, but if you do this all the time, boy, I'm telling you, it will dig it all in. So you renounce that spiritual dynamic and that sin, and you no longer let it live in you. You follow it, you cast it out. And then the fourth R is that you replace what you cast out. Okay. So the thing is that, that Jesus says, if I go out, if I cast out a demon and I go out into dry places and that spirit searches out and he comes back and he finds that house cleaned, swept and unoccupied, he brings back seven more with him. And the latter end of that man is worse than the beginning. And so what we do when we cast it out, it leaves a vacancy. It's like pulling a plant out of a pot. There's a hole that's left void. And so we have to replace that with God's solution. His word is always the solution. So say we, we cast out uh, anger. Uh, well, then what is the opposite of anger? Peace. Peace. So Jesus being the Prince of Peace. Jesus, I receive your peace to fill in that place that was full of anger. And then the fifth R is we're on our way to restoration. Yes. So we may have to do this every day, seven times a day, but as long as we keep doing it, we're whittling away that root system that had a place of a hold within us. So deliverance again is cutting the root removing the replacing it so that we can grow good fruit instead of bad fruit thank you so much for sharing i really appreciate it and i thank you that our viewers appreciate that too the five r's once again are recognize repent renounce replace and restoration so we have a question from one of our viewers her name is yvette uh and so her question is how do you keep love in your heart towards people who continually hurt you Lori, can you answer? okay so <laughs> this isn't there's no simple answer for this right this is it's just walking in love and coming out of agreement with hate right so when i recognize again and this person is ongoing doing damage and especially like some of us moms and grandmas right we're like especially if they're hurting the ones we love Right. How many of you watch a relationship or you watch something in your family and you're like, this is killing me. Right. 
And so a lot of times we, we have people who are hurting people that we love all the time. Right now for ourselves, we can set good boundaries. We can still love people and not have contact with them. But I think when we're watching it, it's harder. Right. And I had to, first of all, like Pastor Kathy just said, the first thing that I had to do, there was someone in my family that was hurting my, my daughter, my grandson. And all, all the time right? All of the time. And as a grandmother and a mom, you just become like a mother bear, right? And I was like, God, I know this is not the spirit. This is Lori bear. This is not Jesus bear, right? <laughs> and so what I had to do is, first of all, I was with a trusted friend and I had to tell her, I have to confess something to you. And she's like, what is that? And I said, I hate this person. I even to say the word, she's like, wow, I've never seen you like that. I didn't even see your face ever do that. And I said, but I have to be honest. I've tried everything I would do with anybody else and it's not working, right? It's not working. I've come to the end. And very wisely, she said, Lori, this is so honest. I think it's already starting. And she said, your countenance is already changing. But I think that it really is this idea of, I have to recognize it again, like Pastor Kathy was saying, go through those five hours would be great with, with hate also. If it's you, you can set a good boundary. If you're watching someone else, you actually just have to confess it and ask the Lord to heal it. Um, and I mean, all this stuff we're talking about today, it's not natural. Right. The natural thing is to stay angry, to stay hateful, to stay hurt, to stay with these, you know, fractions with people of all kinds of, you know, different persuasions. Um, and I think it really has again to do with just me. I've got to just keep myself right with the Lord. I've got to stay connected. I've got to keep my spirit there. And so um, there's nothing you can do about that other person. That's I mean, unless they're criminal. Right. I can't do anything. I literally sit with women who say like now my husband's having an affair. Can you help me? And I take a napkin and I rip it in half. And I tell them because I've been doing this so long. I know I can't help the husband part of the napkin. That's got to go because it's just you and me, girl. I can only help this part of the napkin. And that's you. And if you'll work on this, that will change. I don't know how, but you'll get right. And that's the only person I can get right. And so it's a continual process. Amen. Thank you, Lori. Um, Sandria, would you want to comment on that? Yeah, um, um, I'll comment on it. Um, so <laughs> I actually, actually, um, why I, I chose scripture in First Samuel is because I can relate to Hannah and I dealt with a, a spirit of offense. Uh, and one thing that Hannah did, as I did, was lay before God. And when someone's continually offending you or hurting you or that is combative or has, you know, lifestyle, uh, friction, you really have to take yourself daily to the Lord and really break off that spirit of offense, unforgiveness, and whatever thing that comes with it, maybe envy, distrust, whatever. But I really had to lay before God. And I look back on that year where I was so hurt and so broken, just had friends to come and uh, minister to me, but it was my responsibility to not retaliate, to, yeah. not, to not talk bad about that person. But to say, you know what, God, just like Hannah did, I, I want to make a vow and a covenant with you for my promise. Because the one thing that uh, to comment on what Lori was saying is that when it when it comes to the spirit of unforgiveness, uh, it blocks you. It will block you. It will turn into bitterness. And it will block you from, from blessings. And one thing that we can see with Hannah is that she laid before God, and when she, that broke off her, she was blessed with the birth of Samuel. And I saw in my own life with that uh, that issue of offense that I was dealing with in that year. The next year, that's when I actually got uh, thrusted into the technology industry, and I began to bless in there. But you have to continually, continually break that spirit every single day. If you have to fast the whole day, yeah. <laughs> so I that year, and I fast a third that year and yeah. you just have to keep yourself disciplined because it's based off of you you look at that person and try to hold you know grudges and stuff like that but that's not hurting them that's hurting yes. you that's going to keep you right and you need to move forward in the promises of god and set yourself free yes. so basically i'm hearing you say that you have to continue mm -hmm. to walking in the opposite spirit and you cannot give up it's not going to happen overnight because yeah. I think many of us think that we're just going to have, we're going to choose love. Mm -hmm. And then next thing you know, everything is going to be great. But what I'm hearing you say is that this is a process and it's taking time. And so 
Um, we don't want people to get discouraged in that in that moment of time. Well, you know what? I want to thank you so much for the questions and the answers that you have provided to us and that our audience has asked us for today. We are going to transition into another part of um, our Life Builder seminars. At the end of our seminars, we do a, what is called a, just a prophetic time of ministry. We want to minister to those of you who are listening to the broadcast or who will be joining and listening to the broadcast in the future. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about that? And, yeah. and then um, each one of us can just take a moment to to share something perfectly for the, for the viewers based on the topic right now. Sure. Well, what we're going to do is we're, we're going to allow a prophetic uh, revelation to be released to, to the women as they've heard this. Uh, and uh, our, our uh, engineer, Anne, I'm going to also come in. And there you go. Uh, and so uh, if you would just open your heart and allow God to speak to you, you are here to speak to you right now. So, Amber, do you have anything that you would like to at least you can do up with a, with a prophetic prayer and then we can all jump in and, and, and do that. Um, okay, well, actually, there was someone that was highlighted to me, and I don't know if they're still in. Is that okay for me to start there? Absolutely. Okay, so if I, Carly Gutierrez, is still in here, can you please comment and just let me know that you're here? And while we're waiting to see if she is here, um, I, as I was listening to the two speakers, uh, something that the Lord highlighted to me that I thought was incredible is that here we have generations as well as a, a multicultural representation of the body of Christ. And so I just really sense that even as um, Sindri had brought up generational systemic views and how Lori brought in um, the activating love, um, I was sensing that there was some breaking that was happening, that as people were watching, they were hearing about how they need to really adjust some of their own viewpoints and perspectives. And so, Lord, I just thank you for every woman that is on this broadcast today. I thank you, Lord, that you are revealing the truth of your heart and that you desire for us to walk in love. And you no longer desire for us to act out in anger, act out in offense, act out in rage, but you really want for us to settle in with you and to be changed and transformed by you. So Lord, we just say today that we are women who are ready to be free. We are ready to break the chains of bondage. Uh, to We are ready to, uh, and even if you're in your room and you have to do this, to break yourself free. I just say right now in the name of Jesus, as you break free from those chains, that you will walk in the freedom of love and forgiveness, and you will walk with the hope of Christ and reconciliation. We just declare freedom over every woman here today. We declare that we will have the minds of Christ which seek justice, seek mercy, seek love, and walk in forgiveness in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Uh, either of you have anything to say that you'd like to pray or you have a word of knowledge or anything like that? Yeah, I want to just say right now to any woman that's on, um, I was just sensing that as we were talking and that last question was asked and we started talking about other people in your life that are being hurt continually and you're carrying the weight of that. I feel like right now that the Lord wants to say that there are a lot of weights that are being carried that aren't yours. Yes. And so one of the things is, is, as Pastor Kathy was talking about deliverance, is coming out of agreement. I like to do this, that there's so many lies going on. And today the Lord wants to identify the lies that you're believing that keep, that's keeping you captive and keeping you from loving. And literally, I do this sometimes with my hands because when I start to believe my own lies, I simply just say this, Lord, I want to come out of agreement with that lie right now. And all of a sudden the lie loses its power when you come out of agreement with it. And some of you have come into agreement for so long with a lie and today all of a sudden the truth set in. And what's gonna happen is as soon as we shut this down, you're gonna wanna come back into agreement with the lie. And that's okay, but it, what's not okay is to stay there. And you just come back out of agreement again. And like it's already been said, if you have to do that a hundred times a day, if I feel that I'm not lovable lie, or I feel that like I'm not powerful lie, or there's no hope for me, or I hate, you know, can't come out of hate, can't forgive, that's a lie. And like Pastor Kelly said too, and then I come out of agreement with it, and I come into agreement with the truth. 
And so I just feel like so many right now are gonna have that resonate within you, but then an action has to be taken. And you have to physically keep coming out of agreement with the lie, agreeing with the truth. And if you need to get a hold of one of us later, write something, let us know that we would come into agreement with you, that that is a lie, it's not the truth. And it's as long as you come out of agreement, the power of it won't disappear. Um, and the one thing I've learned over time is that um, you might still hear the voice, but you don't have to agree with it. Thank you. Um, so as to deal with me as it pertains to the season that we're going through, not only as a nation, but as a, as a community within the world. And he referred to me a, a season of calibration. And what calibration means is that it's measuring us up to what he wants us to be. Yes, we have high levels where we are, uh, as it pertains to uh, our spiritual life, but he's leveling us up and helping us realize different issues that we have within the world and also within our nation. And I can really see God just aligning our hearts, aligning our minds and our spirits in this time so that we can shoot forward and when we come out of this thing that will be synced up with the body of Christ to be stronger uh, than before. Amen. Amen. You know, I just have something here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm actually seeing groups of women, and I hear the Lord saying that I'm bringing you into a realm of maturity that you have not known. Because you have focused on self, it's been immaturity, but the Lord says that there is a shift taking place, and I'm moving out of that self-focus into my focus on another and i shall bring to you such a revelation it'll almost be like an instantaneous revelation of my love that you have not known in the past and the lord says that is the place i'm calling you to live in to be mature to be a standard on behalf of my kingdom says the lord and i hear the lord saying that i see you and you are not alone. My love is to embrace you. Come to me with your burdens, with all of your pain, with all of your shame, with all of your hurt, with all of your anger. It's mine. It's what I died for. And I want to give you freedom. I want to give you rest. I want to give you refreshment. I want to be the one to encourage you and build you up when you're weak and weary and tired. I'm the one that is your strength, that you will leave my presence fully equal fully empowered, transformed, come to me. You're with open arms, come to me. I hear the Lord saying in Jesus' name. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, this is to wrap it up our seminar. Mm -hmm. yes. So yes. we had a really incredible seminar. Thank you so much, Cindy, for coming and speaking Cindy. for us. And thank, thank you, Lord, for coming to speak for us. Mm -hmm. And Amber, thank you for being our engineer. We really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Yes, absolutely. Now, listen, we want to remind you that we are believing God, that we are going to be back in our facility for July. Uh, and so we'll be keeping you updated on that. If for some reason they are not going to let us come in person, then we'll be back with our seminar online. But you want to tell us a little bit about that? Our next topic is going to be on um, finding joy in, in your purpose. purpose. Amen. It's going to be fabulous. So I want to just say again, ladies, we're standing with you. We're believing for you. We say that you are are incredible and you are a gift to others so please keep on moving forward keep on reaching out keep on standing in love don't be moved and i'm gonna say it again don't bend bow or compromise but stand in the truth of god because you are somebody's answer because jesus is in you so god yes. bless y'all thank you bye thank you we love you bye, bye.